이 초등학교에서 우리는 선교사들은 모두 승량이 되는 In the primary school, we were taught that all missionaries were terrorists. They told us that a missionary will be nice to you at first, but when they get you into their homes, then they will kill you and eat your liver. There was no food and no work in my village. Like some others, I snuck across the mountain border into China. I picked mushrooms in the hopes of selling them in Chiang Mai. I don't speak Chinese at all. But in the mountains, I met a man. He said, I can sell those for you. And he didn't cheat me. He gave me all the money from the sale. At that time, I didn't know he was past the Han. Over the next two years, I went back several times. Each time, Pastor Han helped me. One day, I asked why he would do this, for he himself was in great danger for assisting a North Korean. It is because I am a Christian, he said. That made me afraid. Was he going to eat my liver? One day, Pastor Han said to me, God is real. There is hope for every person. I could not believe he would say that word. God, nobody says that word. We know it is an act of treason. To speak the name of God can lead to soldiers coming in the night. There will be no trial. No journalists will write about you, and no one will ever dare ask where you have gone. One day I asked Pastor Han for a Bible. He knew that if I was caught with a Bible, my life would be in danger. But over time, I persuaded him. I showed the Bible to my wife. At first, she refused to even look at it. Why would you bring that here, she cried. She knew that if anyone reported that you had even glanced at a Bible, you would be arrested, and not just you. You and all your relatives sent to the concentration camps for years and years and years. Over time, my wife too learned that God is real. She found hope. And then I shared the word of God with my best friend. It was very dangerous for me to share. It was very dangerous for him to listen. One day in the summer of 2016, we heard that some North Korean assassins were being honored by the government, rewarded for their good work for killing a terrorist missionary in Chiang Mai. We knew it was Pastor Han. Who else could it be? We, we were frightened. 
Did they know he was my friend? Did they know I had met with him many times? Pastor Han gave his life, but he gave hope to me and to many other North Koreans. And despite the ever-present danger, many of us will continue to share the message that God is real. We hope that our sacrifice, when the day comes, will be worthwhile, just like it was for Pastor Han. I've just been thumbing through Tortured for Christ, written by the Reverend Richard Vormbrand. It's a most disturbing and challenging book. It is now my humble privilege to present to you Pastor Vormbrand, whose scarred body could not be killed but by the grace of God, whose sharp mind could not be dulled by brainwashing, whose burning heart could not be smothered. Lecture theological professor, author, master of 14 languages, I present to you Pastor Vormbrand. I had children like you. One day I was kidnapped from the street by the communists and I didn't see my children again for 10 years. The children wept after their father who disappeared. Listen, wives. I had a wife she was put in prison when I was put in prison too, and then for years she never knew anymore if I am alive or dead. She was told officially that I am dead. Men were sent to her to say the lies that they are released prisoners and that they have attended my burial, and my wife continued to wait for me because in a vision she saw me. Listen, you who are mothers, my mother died. Her last words were my Richard. She died while I was in prison, waiting in vain for her son to come back. And what has been my crime? The crime of thousands of Christians in the Soviet camp and in Soviet Romania whence I come. My crime has been to confess publicly Christ as savior. I have been a Lutheran pastor in Romania. For years I led there a secret missionary work among the Russian, con the Russian soldiers who had stolen our country. We printed secretly for them thousands of gospels and other Christian literature. We brought many of them to Christ. We have worked also among the Romanian communists. We published books for them. And in the end, in the year 1948, on a day, on a Sunday, while I went to church, I was kidnapped by the communists. Four men pushed me into a van of the secret police. It was on the 29th of February. The first thought which came into my mind when I was in the hand of the communist torturers was that in the Bible the words don't be afraid occur 366 times, once for every day of the year. And because there is the extra day of the leap year, it is not 365 but 366 times. I knew that even in the van of the secret police, I am in the hands of the Almighty God, and this gave quite to my heart. I was led to a prison which is 30 feet beneath the earth, and for years I was kept there in solitary confinement. Don't think that I speak about my sufferings. I speak to you about the suffering of my whole country and of the church behind the Iron Curtain which has given in these years innumerable martyrs, heroes and saints. 
I have been among the little and the weak ones in prison. I speak about these great heroes of faith. In my case, you can see what happened to them. For years we were kept, everyone alone in a cell. Never have we seen sun, moon, stars, flowers, snow. Never have we seen a man except the interrogators who beat and tortured. Air entered through a tube. Never have we had a book, never a bit of paper. When after many years I had to write again, I did not remember how to write a capital D. We lay on a few desks, we looked to the ceiling, that was all. Never could we hear in this prison even the slightest noise. The guards had closed shoes and there was a silence which you could cut with a knife. And now, in this absolute solitude, we could experience if Christianity is true or not. I am a man, a pastor apart, who doesn't know the Bible. I have not read it 14 years and I have forgotten it. I have forgotten my theology, but I have touched spiritual realities. We have touched the world of angels, and with great humility we can reproduce the words of the Apostles in the first epistle of St. John. What we have seen with our eyes, what we have heard with our ears, what we have touched with our own fingers, this we tell to you. The first time when we were put in solitary confinement was like dying. Once the angels of death will take you too, and you will remain alone with the remembrance of your past life. It has been a horrible time every one of us lived again his past sins and his neglects of duties. We remembered everything which we have done wrong. We were now under the eyes of God and we remembered as often as we have said some bad wo word to somebody. We have made some bad deed. We were in prison with one of the greatest soul winners of Romania, something like a Billy Graham of ours. And he told us afterwards that in these years of solitary confinement, he had horrible remorses for the following thing. He had once preached in a great meeting, 400 souls surrendered to Christ, and when he left the meeting, a young man ran after him and said, Pastor, I would like to speak to you. And the pastor turned back and said, I am very exhausted now. I can't. Come sometime. Come another time. And so this young man went away and he never saw him again. Then the communists came to power. On a Sunday, this pastor has preached tri thrice. He was very tired. In the night, the secret police came took him and submitted him to, an in, to a non-stop interrogatory of five days and five nights, and now he could, out of fear of the communists, out of fear of tortures, he could what he could not out of love to Christ. And he said to us that I wept during many days, asking myself how I will appear before God, having brought to Christ only 400, when it could have been 401. So we all had an unimaginable pain in our hearts, thinking that we have not done our utmost for the highest, for the one who has given his life for us on the cross. And when we were in the depths of this remorse and of this pain, at once the walls of the cell began to shine like diamonds. I have heard Bach, I have heard Beethoven in my life, I have seen California, I have seen uh, Neapoli, I have seen many beautiful things. Never have I seen the beauties which I have seen in the dark cell beneath the earth. Never have I heard such a beautiful music as on that day, the King of Kings, Jesus was with us. 
We saw his understanding, his loving eyes. He wiped away from our eyes our tears. He said to us words of love and words of forgiveness. We knew that everything which had been evil in our lives has passed away, has been forgotten by God. And now there came wonderful days. The bride was in the arms of the bridegroom. We were with Christ. We didn't know that we were in prison. Sometimes we were taken to interrogatories. We were beaten. We were tortured. But just as St. Stephen, while they threw stones at him, did not see his murderers, did not see the stones, but saw heaven open and Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, so we didn't see any more the communist torturers, we had, didn't see that we are in prison, we were surrounded by angels, we were with God, we don't believe anymore about God and about Christ and about angels, because Bible verses say like this, we didn't know Bible verses anymore. Not because theological books assert it, but because we have experienced this. And after years of solitary confinement, the worst came. We were put together in great cells. Sometimes in a cell there were 200 and 300. Believe me, those who hear me, I am a pastor. And my duty would be to tell you the whole truth. I'll not do it, because you could not bear to hear the whole truth. I speak in the presence of God. In the prison of Pitesht, Christian prisoners were tied four days and four nights on crosses uninterruptedly. The crosses were put from time to time on the floor and hundreds of other prisoners beaten to death, tortured to fulfill their necessities upon the faces and the bodies of the crucified ones, and then the crosses erected again, and the communists standing around, jeering, mocking, Look, your Christ, how beautiful he is! What fragrances he brings from heaven! And they kick the prisoners to kneel down and to adore and to worship this besmeared living crucifix. Priests and pastors have been put in recipients with the doors of a cell with hundreds of prisoners to the belt, a plate with excrement, a plate with urine was given into their hands, and they were obliged to say the holy liturgy over these elements, and some of them did. When I asked a Catholic priest afterwards, Father, why have you not preferred to die than to participate at this devilish mockery? He reposed on my shoulder his weary head and said, Brother, don't judge me. I have suffered more than Christ. Share our sufferings. Try yourself. Take this evening one little spoon with salt and impose to yourself not to drink water one hour. And then you'll know what Christian prisoners have suffered into the throats of which three, four great spoons with salt have been shed, and then they were kept for hours without water. The worst times came, the times of brainwashing. Who has not passed through brainwashing can't understand what torture it is. From five in the morning until ten in the evening, 17 hours a day, we had to sit just like this. We were not allowed to lean. For nothing in the world could we rest a little bit our head. To close your eyes was a crime. 17 hours a day you had to sit like this and hear. Communism is good. 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 Christianity is stupid. Christianity is stupid. Christianity is stupid. Nobody more believes in Christ. Nobody more believes in Christ. Give up. Give up. Give up. These days, weeks, years, we had to listen to these things. And now when the worst came, and I don't wish to tell you words, because I know you have much communist propaganda in America and some don't believe words. I'll show you, not my body, I don't 
boast with my sufferings. I will show you the tortured body of my fatherland and of the underground church behind the Iron Curtain. Just look here. I am an unworthy and an insignificant sinner and I don't dare to compare myself. But as Jesus showed to unbelieving Thomas the wounds, so I show you, so communist torture Christians, look here. Look here. Look here to the back and I can't show you the whole body is like this. So communists torture those who believe in Christ, who believe in God. Christians are happy to suffer like this. But it is your duty to fight to stop these sufferings and to sustain with your love the brethren who suffer behind the iron curtain for the faith which you yourself have. With red hot iron pokers, with rubber truncheons, with sticks, with all kinds of methods, Christians were tortured by the communists. Before I left the country, I was called twice to the secret police, which told me, preach Christ as much as you like in the West, but don't speak against us, otherwise, for thousand dollars we can find a gangster who will kill you. We can kidnap you and bring you back, as so many have been kidnapped from the West, or we can destroy you morally, inventing some story about you, a story with a girl or theft, or I don't know what. Whatever they would invent about me, they'll surely say something. Even if they would say that I have been a murderer, has Oswald been tortured with you? Has Robbie been tortured with you? It is a crime to torture even a murderer. And I have not told you, I have shown to you what communists do to Christians. And now the miracle happened. When it was at the worst, when we were tortured as it had never happened before in history, just as a flower, when you bruise her under your feet, rewards you with her perfume, the more we were mocked, the more we were tortured, we pitied and we loved those who torture us. It must be clearly understood. We hate communism from all our heart. This devilish system of militant atheism, which must be defeated if the Christian church wishes to live. But we loved the man, and we asked ourselves how to win these men for Christ. Uh, the whole time, uh, during the prison life, we won for Christ our fellow prisoners. Even in the years of solitary confinement, in the great silence, you could hear during the night very discreet noises. Through Morse code, through the wall, from one cell to the other, we preach the gospel and souls have been brought to Christ. But we made the great experiment, the same experiment as in the Acts of Apostles, chapter 16. We shall be prisoners. I have not washed myself three years, you imagine how I looked like. And I had before me the pomposely clad communist officer, we confessed to them about Christ and we converted them. I myself have had before me a communist officer with a rubber truncheon in his hand and I told him about the love of Christ. I told him about heaven, about God. Forever he put his rubber truncheon aside. He asked me, Mr. Wurmland, how can you love me? I would never love somebody who puts me in prison and beats me. And I told him about the new character, about the new heart which Christ gives to men. And they become embodied love. And he became our brother. He entered in prison for having taken our defense. We were the prisoners. We triumphed. We brought to Christ our former Prime Minister, Georg Judej, who after having put in prison thousands of Christians, died confessing his sins, receiving Holy Communion, and changing even his life. Christianity is always conqueror because it has God on his side. We have made the experience that 
communists can be one for Christ and that the work of Christ can be done behind the Iron Curtain. There exist show churches which are worth nothing. But in every communist country there exists the underground church. There exist simple peasants, simple workers, simple men, pastors who go from place to place risking their lives, risking their liberties, risking their families. They work and preach and the communists have given the figure that in 20 years of communist dictatorship in Romania the number of practicing Christians has grown with 300 percent. Jesus has said go and teach all nations, make disciples of all nations. When has he said that we must stop at the Iron Curtain? Usually we are said but you can't work there, you surely can't work with the usual methods. But if we will love as the first Christians loved, as if we will be prepared to give our lives as the first Christians did, then surely behind the iron curtain you can work. I'll tell you my last confirmation class in Romania. I'm a Lutheran pastor and I took a group of 10, 15 boys and girls on Sunday morning to the zoological garden before the den of lions and of tigers. And there I told them, your forefathers in faith have been thrown before the wild beasts for their love to Christ and they died gladly for their savior. You also may be arrested, may be beaten, tortured, killed. Decide here and now if you wish to be Christians or not. They had tears in their eyes when they said yes, and then we didn't bother them anymore asking them Bible verses. They didn't know them. We have no Bibles. And neither could I ask them because I, in 14 years of prison, had forgotten the Bible. We have been in prison horribly doped. We were unimaginably hungry. There was a time when we got one slice of bread a week. But when we forgot theology, when we forgot the Bible, when we forgot the truth about the truth, then we were in God, in the truth. Then we could feel his love, his love towards this, these peoples from behind the iron curtain who are oppressed, who are mocked. His love even for those who mock and oppress. And there in the communist prison we have taken the decision that if ever any one of us will have the privilege to come out in the West, we will reward those who have persecuted us by creating a mission to the communists. Christ in his crown has many precious stones. He has white diamonds and blue sapphires and yellow topazes. He should have also the red rubin of communism. Christ is the king of the Jews, the king of the Gentiles, the king of the church. He must become the king of the communists to help us in this work. One cannot listen to Pastor Bornbrand without being moved to action. 